Yeah. My name is David Frew, and I'm here with my friend Jerry Skripsanek. Jerry and I have just spent uh, the better part of three years doing a comprehensive uh, book about Presque Isle. Not just the state park, but Presque Isle, the uh, great peninsula which protects the Erie Harbor. We started this uh, not knowing exactly how complicated it would be, and it was like unraveling an onion. It just got more and more crazy, bigger. We're here tonight to talk about some of the uh, highlights. We, we know we can't talk about the whole book. We'll let you buy the book and walk around with it under your arm, we'll take in the details later. We tried to pick out a few things that we could chat about that would be most interesting to you. Uh, I'll take one, Jerry will take the next, and we'll alternate so you don't get bored. I'm gonna start talking about Lake Erie, which is the media in which Presque Isle lives. The, uh, water that gives it its sand and makes it come alive. Looking at a chart of Lake Erie, you see this, this, this lovely lake, 240-some uh, miles long, 50 miles wide in the middle, two-dimensional, because you don't appreciate the dynamism of this. This is a living creature. It has the ability to uh, f generate huge waves. It can be as quiet and soft as a mill pond. It can freeze. It can be cold. It can be scary. It can be frightening. It can be lovely can be all those things. First, we should mention to you that uh, Lake Erie is a glacially created lake. It was created by the Wisconsin Glacier. And one of my favorite pictures of the, uh, the, the glaciation of this shows what Lake Erie looked like 14,000, 9,000, 7,000, and 14,000, or sorry, 4,000 years ago when it took on its current relative shape. Interestingly, and if you look at this picture which shows depths. Uh, the original lakes, Erie, were two lakes. There was a lake that went from Presque Isle to the west and it was relatively shallow and large, and a lake that went to the east and it was relatively deep and small. And the two lakes that were originally there before the whole thing filled up with water and became one lake were connected by a channel. It's called the Pennsylvania Channel. It still exists, it's underwater now, and you can see it. It's uh, in yellow, and it's along the American side, or the south side of the lake. It's 40, 50, 60 feet wide, 20, 30, 40 feet deep, and it acts as a pressure relief for the water. So interestingly, the current and the prevailing winds in Lake Erie move uh, from southwest to northeast, from left to right on this scheme. And kind of what happens, since uh, the water is stuck in Lake Erie and there's no real way for it to get out, is the water moves to the Niagara River on the right-hand side, the east end of the lake. It can't fit down the Niagara River, so it turns around backwards and creates a reverse current. And depending upon uh, the, the f ferocity of the currents in, in a particular moment in time, the, uh, uh, f the purpose of the Pennsylvania Channel is to drain the water. One of my fantasies when I was a kid is that somehow the Detroit River got clogged up and um, the, the lake went dry and it would have been possible to walk along the lake. So if, if you could you know, entertain uh, that fantasy for a bit, if you're in the uh, left-hand side of the lake where it's yellow and relatively shallow and walking uh, toward Erie, Pennsylvania and Presque Isle and Long Point, which is on the other side, it's a sort of mirror image of Presque Isle, only three times as large, you would come upon a moraine, an end moraine, in the classic sense of geological end moraines. And that end moraine is 60, 70, 80 feet high, rocky, stiff, and it runs from the base of Long Point to the Pennsylvania Channel and then stops. Uh, that end moraine is really important because it helps to define the two ends of the lake and to create the two different parts of the lake uh, that used to be. Now those two different parts of the lake are still there. Uh, the west end of the lake acts differently from the west end of the, or from the east end. And we'll talk more about that later. We had a lot of shipping uh, in the days before GPSs and radar and lights and the mariners needed a way to find a way into, into the different harbors that had been established. So the United States government established the lighthouse establishment system. 
and under the, it was under the Department of Treasury. And it built and managed lakes, uh, lighthouses all along the East Coast. And then in 1818, they decided to build a lighthouse on Lake Erie. And with Erie's Harbor being the first natural harbor in the Great Lakes, it made sense. The first lighthouse was built right here in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1818. The first lighthouse uh, was in uh, the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Service was reestablished. Uh, the was reestablished the U.S. Lighthouse Service and was merged into the U.S. Coast Guard. It's the U.S. Coast Guard in 1939. The Land Lighthouse, also known as the Prescott Lighthouse, then uh, was built in 1818. It was built as a wooden structure, uh, 24 feet tall. Didn't last very long, and then it. Uh, it was replaced in 1858 by a brick structure. Unfortunately, they built the brick stu structure on what was found out to be quicksand, and it started to lean like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So they replaced it again in 1867 with a stone truck structure, and it, let, it was stayed in service from 1867 until 1880. It was re deactivated in 1880, but was reactivated five years later before be being permanently decommissioned in 1899. Both the lenses and the lantern were eventually removed. The Erie Land House Lighthouse was sold to the Erie City of Erie in 1934. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. It was not owned by the Erie Western Pennsylvania Port Authority. This is what the lighthouse looked after they took off the light in the top. I was born and raised on a street called Lighthouse Street. I basically, as a kid, played ball and ran around the whole area of most of my most of my little life. And what was kind of funny is there was a ball field built right next to it. The only problem is if you hit a foul ball, it went over the fence and down the bank. And being kids, we only had one ball, so we had to go down and find the ball before we could continue the game. Uh, we played there for many years until they started building some houses in the neighborhood and there was dangers of breaking windows, so we cut that out. Right now, the Lane Lighthouse is still in this place. Uh, it has been replaced with a beautiful park and in 2004, the Erie went to the Pennsylvania Port Authority and replaced the top of the lighthouse. Uh, in fact, this, these photographs are the last, I think the last ones I ever took while I was working for the City of Erie Police Department. That was one of the last days I was there. There's a lightkeeper's cottage located on the property. And for many years, it was leased to an individual who got a, a, a kind of a break on the rent as long as he kept the grounds up. Uh, so he would cut the grass. Uh, right now, the uh, land lighthouse is unoccupied, uh, and they're looking at uh, possibly putting a small museum in there. Now, the Prescott Light Station was the reason that they replaced the land lighthouse. This is located on Prescott, and it was called the flashlight. And I'll explain to you that and why it was called that for many years. It was completed in 1872. It cost $15,000. Originally, it was 40 feet high and it extended to 57 feet in 1896. There's 78 steps and six landings to reach the top of the tower. Outside of the lighthouse is square while the inside is round. It's thick, it's, there's six bricks that form the structure of the lighthouse and was electrified in the 1920s. The Prescott Light Station was home to nine light keepers and their families until 1944. Before electric bulbs were added uh, to the lighthouse, the keeper had to climb to the top of the tower every four hours to refill the whale oil lamp. A warning bead visible from that lamp went out 13 nautical miles into the lake, projected by a single oil lamp through a fourth order Fresnel lens mounted at the top of the tower. An example of that lens is on display at the, lamp, at the lighthouse today, and you can see that on the left of the screen. Of course, that lens has been replaced by a simple electric light bulb that's designed to flash when it gets dark. And of course, like I said before, it was electrified in the 1920s. The loneliest job on the earth is a light, keep, light keeper's job. And this is just simply a list of the men that, and their families that lived at the lighthouse. Uh, I won't read them all to you, but they were there from uh, 1873 to 19, 18, 1944. And in 1944, the, press, the U.S. Coast Guard personnel took over the operation of the lighthouse, and basically the families did not live there. However, uh, Park, the Prescott Park uh, management used that as a uh, 
uh, as he got home. The light keeper had to keep the light burning at night from April 1st to November 30th. He had to clean the lens every hour and a half and refill the oil every four hours. And not only that, he also had to maintain the property, keep the grass cut. He had to, he was required if there was a shipwreck to try to assist and help. He had to trim the trees. And the lighthouse system was very, very well uh, promoted. And so there were a lot of people interested and his job was to give tours. And when he was on duty, he had to wear his uniform all day long. Uh, he had a no first aid. And he had to do all that for $670 a year, which today, his salary would be $13,000. The first child, the families that lived at the lighthouse, the first child was born at Prescott was the daughter of the first lightkeeper, Charles Waldo, in 1876. Children of the keepers went to school in Erie. They had to travel by boat because there were no roads out to Prescott at that time, or they travel across the ice uh, to get across the bay. Uh, all provisions were brought in by boat, along a trail from the bay to the lighthouse. Uh, the post house was kept at Misery Bay. This is a photograph of that boathouse before it was torn down. It was called the Government Pier at that time. Uh, the uh, goods were at first initially were taken over a plank, a path that was built from the bay and the boathouse to the lighthouse. It's been replaced by a concrete trail now called the Lighthouse Trail that you can walk on today, all the way from Misery Bay to the lighthouse. There was also a pier that was located on the lake side of the lighthouse where the uh, lighthouse tenders would come in and they'd bring large ball quantities like the whale oil and box supplies that they needed to that, to that pier. Now today, uh, because of the high water, the sand that was hiding it, it has washed it away. You can actually see the remnants of it still there today. The lighthouse started a change. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 18, 1983. It was leased to the Pennsylvania De Department of Conservation and Natural Resources in 1986 by the Coast Guard. And of course, it always became a residence for park managers after the lighthouse keeper moved out. In 2014, it was leased to the Prescott Light Station Organization for 35 years by the state. And of course, when it's open, you can tour it. It's really, really a nice place to visit. Now we have a third lighthouse. It's called the Pierhead Light. And because of the fact that the mariners coming in from the east could not see the channel. In 1920, or 1920, 1827, the uh, federal government decided to improve the channel entering into Prescott Bay, and they formed a channel, but it was hard for the, the uh, ships coming in at nighttime to find it. So they put a light on it, it was called a pierhead light. It was built in 1830, it was built in wood on the North Pier. Uh, a sailing ship coming through the channel uh, went aground and knocked it over in 1857, and they rebuilt it in an iron structure in 1858. As the pier grade longer was expanded, it was moved to its present location uh, at the far east end of the north, uh, north side of the channel into the entrance to Erie Harbor. There are no other surviving lighthouses in the United States of that particular design. The light period light had keepers too. Uh, light keepers kept the, the, were kept the light going from 1835 to 1946. Uh, they had a building that was built alongside the uh, United States Life Saving Service facility, which was located on the uh, north side of the channel. Uh, the, the, uh, Pierhead light is a square taping metal tower, it's 34 feet high. It's a fourth order Fresnel lens used to be used in it. It was removed and placed an electric flashlight and it's currently on display at the Maritime Museum. It's on the far end of the east of the North Pier uh, next to the Coast Guard Station. Well, let's talk a little bit about the sand. Where does the sand come from? The uh, prototypical tree that lives on any sand spit peninsula, at least on the Great Lakes, is called the Eastern Cottonwood. And uh, you probably are familiar with the Cottonwood if you've been around Erie, Pennsylvania in June because about mid-June it starts to snow again. And what you'll hear as a uh, major complaint from people that are varnishing wooden parts on their boats or rolling a new coat of, of sealer on their deck is just about the day they have that going, suddenly all this white stuff flies through the air and lands and sticks on the brand new thing that you've just varnished or painted. 
Well, in actual fact, uh, these seed pods are what creates Presque Isle and all the other, uh, and there are several uh, sand spit peninsulas uh, that work the same way on Lake Erie. There's Rondu, Pili, Sandusky, and Presque Isle, and they all essentially work the same way. Uh, there was a fellow from Pittsburgh by the name of Otto Jennings. Uh, he was a botanist and he was working at the west end of the lake studying plants when a colleague said, if you want to go to a place where you can see a huge variety of plants and see them really quickly, you want to go to Presque Isle because the nature of what's called succession on Presque Isle has created a circumstance where you can walk from the water to a mature savanna in a mile and a half and see six different agriculture, not agricultural, botanical zones and different kinds of plants and critters. Uh, so Jennings became greatly enamored with Presque Isle. Uh, he built a laboratory out there. He used to bring his colleagues from Pittsburgh and from the Carnegie Mellon Institute, where he was also a foundation person here to study. And uh, he is the guy that started to explain how Presque Isle was growing. And here's how it grows. I'm going to oversimplify this. Every 50 or 60 years or so, uh, enough of those cottonwood seeds blow off the cottonwood trees and they go to the east end of the peninsula and sink. Then the following uh, season, when uh, September rolls around and the water level falls, always falls in September relative to the year, a new little ridge line is formed and every 50 or 60 years or so one of those ridge lines grows to maturity. And Jennings argued that the succession that was happening at Presque Isle, which is exactly the same as the succession happening at Long Point, for example, we know that now, led to six major ridges. Uh, they're all in place. You can walk out there and see them if you know where to look for them. And that's a map of Jennings' succession ridges. So when you walk from one ridge line to the next, uh, you're going to be walking through about a century of history. You're going to go through a pond and uh, you're going to come to the next row of cottonwood trees that grew up and captured other stuff so that they would grow there. And the nature of cottonwood trees is they're soft and they don't live a long time. They collapse in place. And then other uh, mature trees that the kind that's supposed to be in a savanna grow between them. Here's a, uh, a sort of a shell drawing of Presque Isle uh, with the ridge lines. <coughs> If you were to drive around the peninsula and stay on the lake side, uh, you would quickly see some of those ridge lines. They start to appear just as you pass uh, the Marina Road, uh, which is technically called West Fisher Drive. And uh, if you'll take a look to your left, you'll see uh, uh, giant sand dunes. And those are the, those are the Jennings uh, uh, succession ridges. As the uh, succession ridges move from east to west, uh, they get older. And first they get bigger, and then they get smaller because they get worn down. Presque Isle became a state park, and Dave will talk about it a little further on in the talk, in 1921. And after the uh, uh, park was established, there was a big push to get some roads built out there. Now up to this point, the neck of the peninsula kept breaking away, and, and finally in 1922, uh, or 1921 or 22, it was healed up and was able to build a road. So the next problem they had was trying to figure out how to get a road out to Presque Isle, which is the best route to follow. They looked at a couple of different routes. One of them was to the head hotels. Now at the head of the peninsula, over the years, there were several hotels. One was the Massasauga Point Hotel, one was the Tracy Point Hotel, and one, another one was the Fisherman's Inn. Uh, they kept getting burned down uh, various fires, so they had to keep being replaced. But the trolley system in Erie uh, built uh, a uh, trolley line out to those hotels so people could go out and dance and do whatever things. Up to that point, they could only get there by boat. So one of, the, one of the ideas was to run down the same trolley line down to the bay. Now back in 1913, uh, the city hired John Nolan, who was a well-noted planner, to come up with a plan for the growth of the city of Erie. And in his plan, uh, he decided that 
that uh, one of the things they could do would build a causeway uh, from just west of the Cascade Docks over to the peninsula. And that by building the causeway, if the peninsula broke away again, uh, it would be no problem because people could still get out to the peninsula because it was connected directly to the shore. Uh, they didn't like that plan. Instead, they decided to, to build a, uh, a road uh, just east of uh, Waldemar Park. And the picture that's shown here shows, is that it shows the road going underneath one of the park rides, which is called the Ravine Flyer. And we'll talk about that in a minute. In 1925, was, the road was completed the water where it's parked. Uh, funding for the road came from the Erie, Pennsylvania Water Commission, who had property in the park and needed to service it. And this was one way that they could get out there uh, to handle and manage their equipment. And <clears throat> this road was chosen and completed in 1925. Uh, in 1927, uh, they decided to build a road all the way out to, uh, uh, to the Thompson's Bay. And the idea was by, came to light by uh, uh, Mr. James Thompson, who was a metal, metal, uh, member of the Park Commission at the time. And he was established that he wanted to uh, build a road out to where, where they were going to build the Perry Monument, which was supposed to be built in 1926. However, uh, the road wasn't finished till after the Perry Monument was built, and it was finished in 1927. In 1930, uh, the other portion of the road was called the Governor Fisher Drive, and it was completed to the Perry Monument. And in 1931, the final phase joining the Fisher Drive to Thompson's Bay on the lakeside was completed. In order to get the uh, road to go all the way around, uh, they had to build a bridge over the entrance into the Rayberry Pond, which is located in the lagoons. Uh, here's an old photograph of it. Uh, if you can go to the park, you'll see two memorials uh, there. One of them is at uh, the turnaround, at, uh, where the end of Fisher Drive, or the end of James uh, uh, Fisher Drive was at the time. And uh, there's a monument there to James. Uh, that's one. Uh, James Thompson should be monument to James Thompson. And then the. Uh, Another monument is where the uh, intersection of the loop that goes out to the peninsula comes out just west of, or just east of uh, Waterworks Park. Uh, this is a kind of a map of how the road used to flow around the peninsula. The big problem was there was only one lane on and one lane off the park. And on real busy days, like especially in the summertime, if a storm would come up, Everybody would try to leave at once and usually resulted in a traffic jam caused by cars that were overheating from the uh, hot day or uh, running out of gas or just simply breaking down and the traffic jam would last for hours. There had to be a solution to it. Also, another problem was that they built the road initially that ran in front of the uh, lighthouse. And uh, that was existed there for many years until 1946 when a storm washed the road away. So they could no longer use that. There was no connection except to go all the way back around. He couldn't do a full loop around a peninsula. So they, they built a bypass road. And if, you go, if you're going out and, and around by Perry Monument and coming back around Sunset Point, you'll see that the road kind of turns inward and comes out on another road. Well, that road that comes out was washed out. And this road that was put in there after 1946 is the bypass around to make up for the, the money of that road that was lost. One of the problems with the roads at Prescott were they were built awful close to the water's edge. It was continuously up to damage from the water. So what they did, uh, and, and with that problem, the high water would cause all kinds of problems, especially stranding people out there. Uh, because the cars back then, if they get in the high water, they would stall because they didn't have electronic ignitions and the wires would get wet and then they couldn't go anywhere. But another example, this was in Thanksgiving 1956, uh, when the duck hunters were out there, this terrible snowstorm that he area, they were stranded out at the Coast Guard. They had to stay at the Coast Guard station for a couple of days before they could get out of the park. I had a couple of friends of mine who was part of that crew that was out there. But in 1956, they decided to do a uh, four-lane road around the peninsula and alleviate the problems, and that's where we have it today. So where does the sand come from? Uh, water is a vehicle for moving sand, and the way the lake works is it takes the sand from the west end and moves it to the east end, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, if the sand gets past Presque Isle, the nature of the deep part of Lake Erie to the east of Presque Isle is that the sand will drop onto the slate bottom and be lost forever, unless it gets, gets trans, transferred right along the uh, docks, or the, sorry, the, 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 the shorelines. So here's a picture of Gull Point, uh, and all the sand that you see on, on Gull Point has uh, arrived there uh, partially by accident and partially due to Presque Isle sand replenishment programs where it's formed like its own little mini peninsula on the end. So uh, the process by which the sand gets deposited as it moves, uh, it's, not, it's not, water doesn't, uh, sand is not soluble, so it's not a solution. It's just a transport agent. Anything you stick out away from uh, the beach on, on Lake Erie, on either side of the lake, if you stick it out far enough, it's going to catch sand. And there's a perfect example of this right here. Nice aerial shot that Jerry took from an airplane that was being flown by a friend of ours. Uh, that's the lighthouse. As you can see, there's uh, a little groin that sticks out there. That's left over from the old days. And it's collecting sand on its upwind, upstream west end. Also, if you're paying attention to the uh, rock mounds that we installed here some years back, uh, sand tends to collect in a little sort of a peak formation called a tombolo between the rock mounds and the shore. Now, right across from uh, Presque Isle, there's another sand spit peninsula. It's called Long Point. It's the mirror image of Presque Isle, three times as long. It has six sand bridges, just like Presque Isle. But since it's six times as long, interestingly, the sand bridges there seem to be five or six times higher than the ones on Presque Isle. And if you're wondering why Long Point is bigger and seems to have more sand than Presque Isle, here's an example of why. When the glacier was moving through here, crunching up stuff and making it into sand, it dropped that sand, and it dropped more on the Canadian side of Lake Erie than it did on the American side of Lake Erie. In fact, there is a sand plain uh, which runs from the base of Long Point uh, probably about 20 miles to the west, and it's about uh, 15 or 16 miles thick, uh, which creates a Carolinian growing area where tobacco grows quite well ginseng, fir trees, etc. So what you see when you, when you go to the uh, west of Long Point is you see stuff like this. This is Sand Hill Park in Port Burwell, which is maybe 14 or 15 miles to the west of Long Point. And all that sand has been constantly falling into the lake and being transported and deposited on Long Point. The other place where sand comes from, of course, is creeks, but most of that sand has been dispatched already. And uh, there's a nice example of people that are uh, interested in not letting their houses fall into the water. So if you owned one of these houses, which was about to fall into the water, which might be worth quite a lot of money, you'd be hiring uh, landscape architects to help you to understand how to keep your, your sand bluffs from collapsing. So on the south shore of Lake Erie, Something that's quite common these days is people are trying to prevent the sand bluffs from collapsing into the lake, uh, which means that there's no sand being transported to Presque Isle, which means for the last 25 or 30 years, Presque Isle is being starved of sand way more than Long Point. So where do we get the sand since it's not coming normally and naturally by process from the creeks, which have probably exported all their sand? or from the sand bluffs along the edges because people are trying to stop it, or from a place like Conneaut, which decided they would catch all the sand, which is 35, 40 miles west of us, and make it into a lovely beach so they can have a recreational port. Uh, we dredge it up, uh, bring it, and put it in a pile on the peninsula, and then we use trucks uh, to move it uh, and put it on the beaches. So we're depositing uh, 2019, 34,000 cubic yards of sand on the peninsula, much of which just goes down the peninsula and disappears or lands on Gull Point. In uh, 2020, that was up to 97,000 cubic yards, which is required because of high water and storms. The uh, 
policing at Prescott has been uh, a, a growing uh, situation over the years. It started off very small. Uh, initially, the peninsula was under jurisdiction of the War Department, uh, but for some reason in 1833, the city very decided they owned it, and one of our primary individuals and responsible for a lot of our development, Erie Rufus Reed, appointed himself as supervisor. Actually, it was a good thing, because at that time, there was a lot of lumbering going on the peninsula, and it was not uh, actually approved. Uh, there was uh, cranberry bogs that they were trying to protect, and people would go over and literally tear them apart every October. They actually passed laws setting up a cranberry day that people could only go over and and Rufus Reeves kind of set up the first law and order at the peninsula. But in 1871, the state of Pennsylvania took it back. But in 1903, uh, the City of Erie Water, water Commission was having a problem. Uh, they were taking water uh, from the city water system out of Prescott Bay, and it was contaminated uh, from the sewage that was going into Prescott Bay down to Mill Creek. So uh, they decided they needed to take the water on the other side of the peninsula in the lake. So the state of Pennsylvania deeded 175 acres to Erie Waterworks. Uh, in 1921, uh, the park became a state park. And of course, the state took over jurisdiction as far as the uh, management and as far as the uh, policing goes. And in 1923, uh, the U.S. government officially planted, uh, gave the ownership of Prescott to uh, Pennsylvania. Now, Pennsylvania's first lawman was the Water Commission appointed Tom Weindorf as a caretaker and also as a police officer in, 19, 19, in 1923. In 1935, he came as appointed the chief of police. Uh, at that time, there were no roads to the peninsula, so he would take the Water Commission's boat back and forth across the bay to go to work every day. And there was a period, and still there's called the ferry dock on the bay side of uh, Waterworks Park, and that's how he used to he used to use his boat to get to work. Uh, they built a home for him out there. The building is still there. It's the superintendent's residence. I don't think the superintendent lives there, but I know one of the park managers do. Uh, he initially patrolled the park on horseback, and then uh, later on uh, they started adding things like motorcycles and motor vehicles and cars. Uh, they built a police barracks near the head of the peninsula in 1935 and served as police headquarters, first, station, uh, first aid station, and the park office. In 1963, it was replaced by the current ranger station. And over the years, the building has been expanded and it is now called the Stahl uh, Center. Uh, example of what the police officers looked like in 1937, you notice they all have breeches on, so they were riding uh, motorcycles a lot. Uh, this is one of the uh, Prescott police cars, uh, it's just an old Ford. And there's a couple of old pictures of some officers on patrol, uh, and of course a little later on in the 50s. Uh, there has, believe it or not, there are crimes that do take, out, take place in a peninsula. Uh, they've had two murders over the years. Uh, but there's a lot of hoaxes that went on. Uh, there was a couple of uh, fellow who claimed he saw a a uh, Loch Ness type monster coming out of the lake one day, and of course it started the investigation. But I, I can remember this one, it was the, uh, the UFOs out at Prescott. That was going on as I was a member of the Erie Police Department. They were taking reports of these strange flying objects seen over Prescott. It turned out it was a bunch of kids who got some cleaner's bags and put some candles in them and let them float away. And it turned out to be nothing but a hoax. But that was a big deal in newspapers and the news. And we were taking reports every day of people seeing these flying saucers uh, out over the park. Uh, this is the police force in 1960. Uh, there were seven full-time officers and four part-time officers in 1960. And included this photo is, the photo is uh, Chief Dan Descanio, who would become the first longest-serving park chief of police. In 1995, uh, park uh, police officers became rangers. I'm gonna go back one slide here a second. Uh, in 1975, uh, the, uh, there was some union, uh, some uh, labor dispute between the state of Pennsylvania and the AFSCME union. And all the park police at that time were members of the AFSCME, AFSCME union. So they decided they would take their firearms away. And they were actually disarmed in 1975 for a few days while that strike was going on. 
And so uh, they sent Erie police officers to assist on weekends to help patrol and help assist the officers then. And in 1995, uh, the park police became rangers. Uh, the complement is usually between 10 and 12 men. In fact, on this photograph, there are at least two officers, two park rangers in this picture that actually became city of Erie police officers. And a lady that's in a picture actually became the wife of one of the city of Erie police officers. So we had a Vested. And there was a lot of police officers that went out and worked at the park after they retired. I had a f friend of mine who's just being hired on Monday. He's been retired from your police and now he's going out to uh, be a park ranger part-time. Well, one of the persistent questions that always comes up when we're talking about Presque Isle is, did Native Americans ever really live there? And of course, that leads to a discussion of the Erie's Indians. Who were the Erie's Indians, and did they really ever live on Presque Isle? The answer to that is almost certainly no. Uh, they probably never used canoes like this. Uh, they, they did, interestingly, fish. Uh, in fact, uh, if you would take a look at um, the trails and uh, trading routes of the Native Americans that lived between the Hudson River and the Mississippi, uh, the North, uh, or you know, the Canadian uh, North Northland and the Gulf of Mexico, would have looked like a Rand McNally map. There was trading going on between between tribes all over the place. So, who were the Erie's Indians? Uh, well, probably most of the people who were were Native Americans, North and South Americans came over the uh, land bridge during the time of the glacier. And there are a couple of different st traditional routes that they took. Uh, some went right straight down to South America. Others, uh, when they started to sense that things were filling up in South America, made left turns in North America and uh, started to head for the East Coast. Uh, the people who were heading for the East Coast were largely hunter-gatherers and they were in the minority. So as of about the year 1492, when Columbus was coming here for the first time, uh, there were probably 70 million native North and South Americans, and probably 80% of them lived below uh, the Rio Grande. So way more in South America than in North America. We know that the South American cultures were more advanced and the people there were bigger. Uh, they were uh, dug in. Uh, they were agrarian, they ate more, etc. So here's what we think we know these days about uh, the Erie's Indians. We know this because of a guy by the name of Chief Joseph Brandt. Uh, Chief Joseph Brandt was uh, the son of an Indian uh, princess and a British uh, trader. And he was, uh, he was educated on the East Coast in an in American college slash university and uh, became uh, a quite, quite well known amongst the people who we now think of as the Six Nations. Of course, in his er early days, it was the five Iroquois nations, or Iroquois. Uh, the Iroquois lived uh, west of the Hudson River and uh, they were named Iroquois against, they never called themselves that, uh, by other Indians that didn't like them. Uh, Qua was a French derivation that meant people of, and Iro meant of rattlesnakes. So because the uh, Iroquois seemed to be scary, uh, they were named people of the rattlesnake. Chief Joseph Brandt uh, organized uh, the, the five tribes and against the logic and general cosmology of Iroquois Indians at the time, he convinced them to take the British side during the American Revolution. And of course, uh, when the war was over, he knew he had screwed up and he had lost. So he took 2,000 Iroquois and he left and he was given a fat deal uh, as the guy that ran the Ford on the Indian Trail that went from Toronto to Detroit. And at the place where that crossed the Grand River, which is the largest river on the other side of Lake Erie, there was a longtime ford that was productive, taking people back and forth. And uh, they named that town Brant Ford. So that 2,000 people that went over there and formed the nucleus of one uh, Iroquois nation 
uh, are still there, and that's a good place to go and learn things because they think that they have a duty uh, to try to keep track of all the uh, Native Americans that lived at least on this side of the world. Uh, this is the Chapel of the Mohawks at Brantford, and uh, that's one of the beautiful places on the campus of the uh, Indians over there. And some of the names that you'll recognize as famous people that uh, were born there, uh, Tonto, as in the Indian companion of the Lone Ranger, the, t t the TV Tonto, not the radio Tonto, he was born in Brantford. And Graham Greene, the famous actor who was in Dances with Wolves and is still acting vig vigorously, is uh, from there as well. Now, who were the Erie's Indians, and what do we know about them? Well, the Erie's Indians probably numbered 13,000. They lived in stockaded villages of 100 or so, and they were spread out between uh, Dunkirk and uh, Sandusky. And of course, they lived along the edge of Presque Isle as well. There were at least two uh, Erie's villages here. Uh, when, the Amer when the Americans, when the British and uh, the Dutch came, to this country, they decided that the thing that the, would be the most valuable trading commodity that they could get would be furs. So the Spanish were chasing after gold, uh, the British, the French, all the other uh, European countries were more interested in furs. One of the most popular furs was a beaver because you could almost take it as it was, stretch it and make it into a beaver hat, which was extraordinarily popular in Europe at the time. So to get their beavers, what they did was they traded guns uh, to the Iroquois, and the Iroquois started shooting beavers, and then they started trading or whatever for beavers that the tribes to the west of them could capture. Then they finally decided the best way to control the wealth coming from the beaver trade, and this was called the Beaver Wars, was to simply annihilate all the, tra the, all the tribes. Amongst the tribes that got annihilated by uh, the Iroquois, and of course it wasn't the Eries who were warlike, it, it was the Beaver Wars uh, and the Iroquois with guns uh, were the Eries. And they became obsessed with getting rid of them uh, and they, they annihilated them one village at a time, starting at Dunkirk and heading towards Sandusky. Now, uh, all around the Lake Erie, uh, there, were, uh, there were tribal uh, trading agreements uh, the specialty of the Iroquois was poisoning the creeks and grabbing the fish when they died and drying them and then selling dried fish. There was a tribe on the other side of the lake that sold tobacco, traded tobacco. There was a tribe on the other lake that liked to capture deer and herd them as domestic animals and sell them that way. There was a tribe near Buffalo uh, that marketed flint for arrowheads. And of course, all this happened before European contact. There was only one European that ever contacted uh, the, the Erie's Indians, and that was this guy by the name of Etienne Brule. Uh, Etienne Brule was sent by uh, Champlain, who was the governor general of New France. He was sent to figure out exactly what the heck was going on on the south side of Lake Erie. The French knew pretty much what was happening on the other side. They were trading with the Hurons, but they wanted information. Etchion uh, encountered the Eries trading with other Iroquois at Niagara, and he noted that they were way bigger than all the other Iroquois, and they were disliked. And one of the reasons why they were disliked is because every year the Iroquois held uh, games uh, somewhere near uh, the, the, the Kinzu Reservoir, is where the, the essence of the games was. Before there was water there, there were games. And uh, because they were bigger and more athletic, and heavier and healthier, uh, the Eries always dominated those games, so they were not liked. Where did they go? Uh, by the time the Iroquois with guns had fought the uh, Eries, who only had poison arrows and spears to defend themselves, by the time most of them were gone, the rest of them just decided it wasn't worth fighting, and they left. Some of them probably went west, some of them probably went south. We're not sure where they were. Presque Isle has been a magnet for fishermen ever since it was discovered by the, by the French. And at one point in time in the 1920s, it was called the freshwater fishing capital of the world. 
Today, it's still considered, a it's considered the fishing capital of, freshwater fishing capital of Pennsylvania. And it is. It brings in $49 million annually into the Erie County coffers. During the 1920s, there were 144 fish tugs that operated out of Erie. There were 14 fish houses that processed and sold the fish, and they had 3,500 jobs. They had the most commercial licenses, however, were in 1915. Uh, this is just a graph of how many uh, fish that were taken between 1918 and 1927. At the top of the chart, there was 85 million pounds taken of Cisco, which was a lake herring that was taken between 1918 and 1927. Uh, there was 21 million pounds of, of blue pike was taken in that same period. Total to the catch for that period was 113 million pounds of fish. Uh, for a value of six million dollars, which today is worth about 112 million. In order to support the fishery, the, uh, the uh, fish, uh, the fish commission appointed it was appointed, and they built the first hatchery in Erie on the corner of Second and Sassafras in 1885. It was a frame building. Uh, they had hatching jars inside, and they had rearing ponds in the backyard. Uh, it had a wrought iron fence, and if you go there today, you can still see that wrought iron fence on the corner that surrounded the hatchery. The problem was uh, the city of Erie decided to, start, decided to start chlorinating their water, and they no longer had a water supply that could finish, uh, that a raw water supply could finish the hatchery the second side. So they built another hatchery in 1916, located on the, at the base of Chestnut Street. Uh, today, uh, that building is still in existence. It is now the Water Authority building. And there they produced millions and millions of small fish for, for stocking into the bay. One of the problems that they had with raising fish is you can only raise them just so large in tanks or they start cannibalizing each other. So they decided that uh, they would build some rearing ponds on Presque Isle and take the small fish fry, bring them over to the ponds, let them grow for a while, then release them into the lake. So in order to do that, they had to dredge a lot of the ponds out and they had to fill a lot of the ponds that Dave just mentioned that were growing as a result of the uh, progression of growth on a peninsula. Uh, but they did raise native fish as well as amphibians like frogs and they uh, later raised them for stocking the Presque Isle uh, Commonwealth waters. They also traded a lot of these eggs to other, other uh, fish uh, cultural stations throughout the United States in order to get some fish that we didn't have like trout. Uh, they were brought in uh, from these other hatcheries as, as a trade. Now there was some commercial fishing in Frisco. Most of the fishermen used pound nets. And a pound net works by driving stakes into the bottom of the lake and su suspending nets on them and uh, directing the fish through these arms of these nets into a, an area called a pound. Uh, very, very prominent around Frisco because these nets were need needed a sandy bottom in order to pound the stakes in. We had two uh, families that fished in that manner off of Presque Isle, and that was the Rell family and the Weindorf family operated. Uh, these photographs shown here are showing some of the uh, Rell family pictures of them tending, pounding the stakes into the lake and tending the nets and getting some fish out. If you take a second to look at them, uh, again, like I said, they would drive these 50 or 60 foot long poles into the lake bottom, suspend nets on them, and the fish would swim into them and be caught into a pound. One of the big problems they had with these nets is these big fish called the lake sturgeon would get at them and they would literally tear the nets up. It was a real nuisance to the fishermen at the time because these nets were expensive. So they didn't really like the fish so they just threw them. They threw them into an area on the peninsula to die or to rot. That area was called stinkhole. If you come out of the peninsula, uh, it's an area just, uh, uh, just as you pass the feather on your way out, that whole area in there was called stinkhole. And it was called that because all this rotting fish used to be back there back in the 1920s. Uh, sport fishing on a peninsula is a big deal. Uh, people come all and what's really great about it is there's all kinds of places to fish. It's all free public access. Uh, you'll see boats everywhere throughout the year. Bass fishermen, ice fishermen, canoeists, kayakers, everybody out there fishing trying to catch some fish. Uh, sport fishing, shore fishing is another thing. Uh, you have a lot of areas that you can fish. There's just some piers. One of the prominent areas that we like, Sons of Lake Erie, is we use the Rotary Pavilion floating dock. And there's a lot of little tiny fish available, and it's really great for kids because it's safe. They can catch a tiny fish, and almost everybody catches one there. 
Ice fishing is very popular in the wintertime when we do have ice. Unfortunately, over the years, uh, we get some years we, we don't have ice at all, but uh, when we can, even back in the 20s, you can see there were cars out on the ice uh, doing some ice fishing. And uh, we didn't have any ice last year, but the year before that we did, we had some good ice fishing. Uh, also, you sit out there all day long and catch a few fish, watch people skate. It's just a big, fun carnival atmosphere for ice fishing. Well, let's uh, talk for a bit about how Presque Isle became a state park. There was a fellow by the name of Isidore Sobel, uh, who was a uh, sort of a community activist. He prided himself on being able to uh, understand and fix business problems. He uh, rescued Hammett from bankruptcy. Uh, he went and worked as a consultant for the post office, made it whole again. And uh, he was active in the uh, men's uh, discussion group at his uh, Jewish synagogue. And uh, they became disturbed about the fact that uh, there was uncontrolled market, market hunting, uh, logging, and trapping going on in Presque Isle. They were afraid that uh, if left alone, the place would be denuded and it would fall apart, uh, and the roots of the trees and brush that were stabilizing the peninsula would be uh, gone and the whole thing would collapse and the city of Erie would lose its fabulous harbor. So he and his cronies decided that they should probably try to figure out how to rescue it and uh, they came up with the plan of making Presque Isle into a national park, which was his obsession. Now I should mention that he was a politically active guy. He was the chairman of the Pennsylvania Republic Park, Republican Party. Uh, and uh, was very well liked, very well known uh, throughout the country. He became obsessed, uh, and, and uh, his his uh, his working group uh, also became obsessed with trying to make Presque Isle into a national park. They took their they took their proposal to Washington. They knew it was going to work, and then they got they got uh, uh, turned down. And they were turned down because just about the time uh, that he was asking to make Presque Isle into a national park. Uh, another national park on the Great Lakes opened at Mackinac. So Sobel went back uh, to the drawing board and decided maybe a second best alternative would be to make it into a state park. And uh, he went to Harrisburg with the same group, dusted off the proposal and presented it to Harrisburg. In Harrisburg they said, you know how much this is going to cost? And he said, well, yeah, I've got some, some numbers right here. He said, well, we don't think you can raise that money. We don't think uh, Erie could support something like that. So we'll agree that you can have uh, a state park at Presque Isle if you can raise, and they threw, they threw out a, a number, which was essentially about 70% of the money they thought they would need to get this off and running. And of course, Sobel, who knew that that was going to happen because he had uh, influence and he had spies at, at uh, Harrisburg telling him, what the argument was going to be, he had already gone to work in, as a fundraiser and raised about 80% of that amount. He said, well, we'll be, be back to you. So the people at Harrisburg said, here's your, here's your due date. If you don't have this money be raised by this time, it's over. But if you can do it, okay, we'll make you a state park. And they never in a million years thought that he would be successful. He returned to Erie, uh, bowed off of every committee except uh, he hired himself he worked for free to be the fundraiser. And uh, they had nine months to raise the money. In three months, they had the money plus 15%. That's how Presque Isle became a state park in 1921. And of course, as soon as they became a, a state park, everybody in Harrisburg was stunned. They had no idea to how to run such a park. How would they get roads out there? Would they get roads out there? How would they handle it? Uh, but this is the guy who may be the most responsible for creating Presque Isle State Park. It's hard to talk about Presque Isle State Park without thinking about Waldemar Beach Park. Uh, you pass it every day when you're on your way out to the park. How did it get there? Well, back in uh, 1867, uh, the first trolley company was built in the area, and it was a horse-drawn uh, company. And then uh, the uh, Venture Electric was one of the first trolley lines in the United States to get electrified, mainly because uh, Charles Strong was good buddies with uh, uh, Thomas Edison. And so we had one of the first electrified trolleys in the United States. Uh, 
Uh, the trolley system was in existence in the area from uh, 1867 to 1935. Well, one of the problems was uh, with the uh, five-day work week, 40-hour work week going, they, they needed business for the weekends. So they decided they would start some uh, amusement parks and, and other parks for people to go to on weekends to provide traffic for the trolleys. Well, we had a several. Actually, we had four trolley companies in the city of here. We had the uh, Erie Electric uh, Motor Company. Uh, they operated, they had their trolleys went out to a park called Four Mile Park, which is located off Lawrence Park. And they also had the Erie Exposition Park, which was located, or the County Exposition Park was located on what is today's Iroquois Avenue. But they also uh, bought Waldemar Park. Uh, and they also had ran their trolley down to the uh, Mississauga Point Hotel, uh, which we mentioned before. Another call a trolley company was the County and Erie Traction Company. It had a park in Elk Creek Park. A lot of the buildings are still there. The Lake Erie Traction Company, Buffalo and Lake Erie Traction Company, ran a trolley from here to Buffalo, and uh, they had a park at Orchard Beach in Northeast. And the uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania Traction Company uh, ran to Meadville uh, from Erie, and they had a branch line that went to the uh, Exposition Park in County Lake. Uh, they actually had trolley park, tra tracks went down and they had a press guy off of the trolleys and there was no, no uh, problem to start running over. Uh, the uh, different stores and companies would have uh, weekend picnics and they would take the trolleys out to these different parks. Uh, here's a photograph of the uh, postcard showing the trolley station at Waldemere. Now Waldemere's history started as Hoffman's Grove in the late 1880s. It was leased by the Electric Motor Company in 1896 and renamed Waldemere, meaning uh, Woods by the Sea in German. Uh, roller coasters, dance hall cars, the carousel was added. In 1922, the Green Bean Flyer and the Old Mill were opened under the management of uh, Alex Moeller. The Ravine Flyer was a uh, roller coaster that actually went over uh, the Peninsula Road or Route 832. And uh, it was there for uh, till the 1930s. And then they uh, uh, had an accident and they didn't run it again, but it was replaced later on uh, in 2000, I think it was. Uh, uh, Alex Muller took over ownership of the park and then he hired uh, a friend of his, 11-year-old uh, Paul Nelson, uh, who was a family friend, came to work with him. In 1965, Mr. Muller died and Paul Nelson took over as general manager and later the owner of the park. Uh, Waldemar began a period of growth with, which has been unbelievable. And the addition of water park and new and innovative rides like the Ravine Flyer 2 were added to the park. It's actually a, a, a gem. Um, it's one of the few parks, except for this year, you could actually go on with your family. It didn't cost you anything to get on the grounds. It was a great, it's a great family thing, and I, I hope uh, they have a better year this year. These are some of the, just a couple of vintage rides. The first uh, roller coaster was called the Figure 8. Uh, that was back in the 1920s. Then they went to a wooden roller coaster called a Comet. And they, I can remember, it's something called the, the Flying Scooters. And they had a Midway. Uh, they actually had a beer garden. Uh, all kinds of entertainment was going on. And uh, this is just some pictures of the old Ravine Flyer as it went over the park. And there's the uh, uh, place where you boarded the Ravine Flyer. And this is the new Ravine Flyer. Uh, which was built in, the two, in 2000. Uh, it's one of the, you know, uh, a wooden roller coaster, and it's uh, known all around the world. They have actually people that travel from all over the world looking and riding on these different wooden roller coasters. They also had a beach, which is located below the bluff, right along the lake shore. Uh, they had an incline that would carry the, uh, carry the uh, people from the park down to the beach. My favorite place that I remember was the monkey boat. They had monkeys uh, that uh, uh, they would bring in every year. And I can remember in grade school, uh, we would have our school picnics out at, out at Waldemere. And as kids, we would tease the monkeys, get and throw things at them, get them th to throw things back. And sometimes they threw things you didn't want to get hit with. But uh, that was quite a bit of amusement. Now, Dave and I met with Mr. Nelson several years ago. And he told us that the uh, monkeys that he used, he had to change them every year because they became very colonized. And they would actually form little tribes. 
And so they would change them out every year. And some of these monkeys were actually used in space exploration. They were sent into space. Mr. Paul Nelson, uh, he's in his 80s now, uh, has been the manager and owner of that park for all these years. A super, super guy. You just can't ask for anybody nicer. Uh, for a, he has a vision. Uh, he told us that his plan was to reactivate the Waldemar Beach whenever they would become possible, running an incline in a restaurant down on the beach. And that's all I got about Waldemar. Uh, also, they added their water world, and they keep expanding it. Uh, it's it's just uh, one of the best water parks around. You know, it, of course, the park only operates from uh, Memorial Day till Labor Day, so this was a bad year for them. That's our last slide, but it's not the end of the Prescott, we hope. We could go on talking about this forever, but you probably have something to do tomorrow, yeah. uh, and we've probably taken too much time. <laughs>